this uh, is labeled as a discussion of the book, but actually I'm trying to limit at least my part of it to the uh, things that are relevant to the Beister group, most relevant. There's a lot more stuff obviously in the book and I see some of the comments are probably going to go on broader topics, but I'm going to try to stick to a fairly narrow uh, topic, uh, chapter 3.1 and 4.3 uh, in the book and uh, concerning uh, people's thoughts about corporations and uh, about capital ownership, ownership of the means production and all that. <clears throat> So the thing I start with here is uh, what I call the fundamental myth. And uh, this is, I think, Marx's biggest blunder. Uh, Bo uh, says it's the second biggest blunder, but it certainly ranks up there among the top uh, blunders uh, in Marx. And uh, the way he arrived at this idea was to start with the feudal notion of land ownership or, or dominion. And so if you were a Lord, today we have landlords, but in the feudal times you had the Lord of the land and uh, whoever lived on the land was automatically under your governance and whatever they produced was automatically your property. So the sort of key uh, passage in Marx is to say that <clears throat> it's not because he is a leader of industry, the man is a capitalist on the contrary, <clears throat> He is a leader of industry because he's a capitalist. The leadership of industry is an attribute of capital, just as in feudal times, the functions of general and judge were attributes of land and property. So Marx in effect took this notion of dominion from analysis of feudal property rights and substituted capital for land. And uh, so that's the idea. The fundamental myth is this idea that the, the management rights discretionary control rights over production or attached to the ownership of the means of production to capital and the right to the product is automatically attached to the means of production in the capitalist system. And, and uh, it's a very deep myth. It comes out all over the place. Uh, the very name capitalism, as we see, comes from this. And uh, the defenders of capitalism were more than willing uh, to accept Marx's uh, blunder. And, and uh, so they could say that they're just defending the rights of property uh, when you have the renting of people in the firm. So let's analyze this idea. Here I give a couple of quotes uh, from non-Marxists uh, about this fundamental myth. So Ernest Baker was a British uh, liberal uh, capital L and, and uh, philosopher of, of governance, the owner of the capital resources, controls and determines in virtue of such ownership, the process of production and the action of the workers who are engaged in the process. In its unqualified form, capitalist organization is a form of autocracy or absolutism. So that's, that's uh, Baker say not that you have control of the workers because you rent them, but simply because of virtue of your ownership. So that's a, a, uh, that's a sort of the governance version of the fundamental myth. And here is another quote down here, legal rights to the management of production to the whole product are essentially components in the bundle of legal rights called the firm. In the capitalist system, these legal rights are attached to capital, typically attached in a corporation, the owners of the firm are the owners of capital assets of the enterprise, stockholders. These divine rights of capital, the right to management of the whole product, vastly extend the usual legitimate rights to receive rent or interest for the use of one's capital. And they are the defining characteristic of this peculiarly capitalist property system. So this states it very clearly, the, the fundamental myth and uh, I didn't include this in the previous slides I gave you, so I wonder if anybody can guess who this person was that totally swallowed the fundamental myth. I don't know, some left-wing loser in Cambridge. That's what yeah. I'm guessing. But it, you know, it, was, it was written in 1971, published in 73, so it's a half century ago. So who was this left-wing loser? 
why I think, gentlemen, it was David Ellerman himself. That's right. This was the younger version, the century old, half century old version of myself. And uh, so this was my first writing on the topic. I totally swallowed the fundamental myth, said it very clearly what it was <clears throat> in this book. We didn't even have the language of worker ownership then. We called it workers control, which was a British, sort of the British phrase. So it took me a year or two after uh, writing this that I realized how wrong this was and sort of worked my way out of it. <clears throat> so the counter argument is that we're talking about legal structure. We're not talking about the power. I mean, every schoolboy knows that capital has the power to rent the workers. But we're talking, what is the legal structure of the system? Is it based on the ownership of capital as I thought in my earlier self? Or is it based on something else? What, what is the sort of key defining institution of the system as we see it? And the, the way out of this fundamental myth is very easily. Uh, capital can be rented. And when capital is rented out, <clears throat> the capital can be rented just like workers, then the capital owner is not, doesn't have the management rights and doesn't have the product rights in the company. So it doesn't take a lot of intellectual power to realize that it's that the who does have those management rights and who does have the the uh, rights to the product is not due to the ownership of capital legally it's due to the contracts that are, that are made and and uh, so and this includes even if even if the owner of the capital is a corporation so ownership of corporation does not determine who is the firm here i'm using firm in a in a uh, special sense, firm is, is the productive enterprise determined by contracts, who rents what or whom. And uh, this, some other people have also independently uh, developed this terminology, this um, French legal theorist, Jean-Pierre Robet uh, also says the firm is, is determined by the contracts you make, it's not the same as the corporation necessarily. And uh, this is what Bo calls the contract theory of power. So it's the contract that determines who has the governance right in, the, in legally, not simply uh, the ownership that means production. So here is Chris uh, dug up this lovely picture and it's a great counterexample uh, where, where it's a whole factory uh, that is rented out. So this is in the 50s, Studebaker Packard was one of the many producers of cars then. And uh, their, the Packard auto bodies were produced by Briggs Manufacturing in Detroit, in, in the Connor Avenue plant in Detroit. And so when Briggs died, the family sold all their, US, they had 12 US plants. Uh, they sold them all to Chrysler. And then as, as this quote here says, the Connor Avenue plant had been building all of Packard's bodies, was leased to Packard, in other words, the Studebaker Packard, to avoid any conflict of interest. So here we see a clear separation. We see Chrysler here taking over from Briggs Manufacturing in the picture. But here we see a clear separation that everything is determined by who rents what or whom. That the Chrysler owned the means of production in any sense that they owned the entire factory, and yet it was leased out to Studebaker Packard. So Chrysler did not have the management rights over the discretionary management control over the workers in production because they didn't hire the workers in the plant. Studebaker did. <clears throat> and they didn't have the ownership of the products that were produced nor the liabilities uh, that were incurred. So this is a case where the ownership of corporation, in this case, the whole factory was not ownership of the firm. And it's this contractual fact pattern, how the contracts are made uh, that determines it. And the way you make contracts is not part of ownership. You can't determine other, you can't say I own a fact pattern that you have to rent something, you have to rent yourself to me or you have to buy the product in the future. That contracts in a market economy can be made one way or the other. And, and uh, so in that sense, there is no ownership of the firm where you mean by firm, the, the ongoing enterprise determined by the contracts. So it's not an ownership thing at all. It's a contractual thing. And uh, that's 
very fundamental point as to the narrative one uses to describe these, these matters of production. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the whole capital-based narrative center of ownership is just wrong-headed. It's, that was a huge blunder. <clears throat> and uh, it's like uh, if you talked about slavery in terms of whether this slave plantations were privately owned or government owned or socially owned, it's the wrong way to analyze it. The problem of slavery was not who owns the plantations. Now, here's an example of uh, a supposedly profound uh, liberal philosopher, John Rawls. And you'll notice in all these quotes, he's totally a slave to this idea that who owns the meat's production or who owns property property is what determines everything. So under socialism, the means production are owned by society. First principle justice includes the right to private personal property, but this is different from the right to private property and productive assets. So a lot of people make this distinction between personal property and productive assets as if the assets, whoever owned that was automatically the firm. Welfare state capitalism permits a small class to have a near monopoly on the means of production. Property owning democracy avoids this by ensuring widespread ownership of productive assets. So Rawls in his whole writing throughout his life, writing about justice never once questioned the renting of human beings, the human rental contract. It was always a question of who owns the productive assets, who owns the means of production. So his idea of a property owning democracy was widespread ownership of productive assets sort of spreading shares out. And, and uh, we've seen that same idea come up uh, many times. <clears throat> so the, even the name capitalism, of course, the name of Marx's book, Capital, and the name capitalism is a misnomer. That that's not, the ownership of capital is not the determining feature. Private ownership of capital is not the deciding institution and the person, the person that points this out is Frank Knight, who is by far the most sophisticated defender of the whole system of renting human beings. And uh, so in the book, I make him the, my uh, antagonist, the, the primary antagonist, because the other, other people that try to defend the system are usually very superficial. But uh, Frank Knight really thought the whole thing through and really understood the system very well and, and, uh, and so I, I quote him quite a bit, but he, he makes the point here that, that Karl Marx, <laughs> more classical than the, the classicals themselves, and uh, he was miscalling the modern economic order capitalism. Ricardo followers certainly thought the system is centered around employment and control of labor by the capitalist. In theory, this is of course diametrically wrong. The entrepreneur employs both labor and capital the latter including land, labor and capitalists play the same passive role over against the active entrepreneur. So this was this idea that everybody else involved in the firm is, is essentially like a machine, just a rented uh, piece of capital or rented human being, and the entrepreneur is responsible for everything. And uh, that was the, the essentially uh, uh, Knight's view. And he says, the superficial observer is typically confused by the ambiguity of the concept of ownership, which is perfectly correct. So Knight really nailed it here. He didn't, his theory about who was responsible for production wasn't very good, but his idea that capitalism is a misnomer, a miscalling of the system, and that most people are typically confused about the concept of ownership. So let's now get a little closer to the, uh, just the corporation rather than the whole system. And in the economics literature, we have this um, uh, idea of the labor managed firm. And then you have people, uh, writers in that tradition that have this nice symmetric uh, idea that the conventional corporation is capital managed, KMF versus LMF. And isn't that nice? A nice symmetric treatment of both sides. So. The one case it's based on labor and the other case it's based on the ownership of capital. So that's still using the fundamental myth that it was the ownership of capital in a conventional firm that counts. And, uh, and you even have 
the idea that ordinary corporation is owned by capital investors rather than label investors. This is, this is a phraseology that we've seen a lot of recently. And one of the people that's uh, thought this through in a hostile way is Henry Hansman, a law professor at Yale University. And he even says that the, the, uh, if you think of all firms as cooperatives, and he does think of all firms as cooperatives, then it's simply a matter of who is the member based on their patronage. So in a worker cooperative, patronage is labor. And he says a conventional firm is, is just patronage is supplying the capital to the firm. And that, so he calls it a capital suppliers co-op. And this is precisely the structure that underlies the typical business corporation. So Hanselman is making analysis very much like the LMF versus KMF, the one worker co-op based on patronage is labor, the conventional firm is patronage is supplying capital. <clears throat> so let's look at how you get ownership of, of the shares in a corporation. And uh, these are all different ways in which you can get ownership of, of uh, shares in a corporation. And in fact, the, they're the same way you, you might get shares in any property. You could create the shares by the founders when you incorporate the corporation and do the original allocation of the issued shares. You can purchase shares from a corporation for money. So that's the example where you are supplying capital. <clears throat> you can purchase shares from other ownerships, other shareholders, and that's not supplying capital to the firm. You can get the shares as a, as a, a you know, worker, uh, as, as a profit sharing in shares, as a hiring bonus or any other sort of bonus in the corporation. So that's not supplying capital to corporation. And you can get them as a, as a gift, which is for no consideration. And that's not supplying capital to corporation or you can inherit the shares. So all these are ways you can get shares and only one of them is supplying capital to corporation. So this whole idea that a corporation is based on who supplies the capital is simply false. And, and uh, you don't need to do a lot of analysis to see that there are all sorts of different ways you can get shares. In fact, they're basically all the ways you can acquire any property. So the real question is how did the shares in ownership or membership, we should say in a corporation become property as opposed to a personal right? How did they become a property right? And that's the correct analysis of the standard corporation is that it's like, it's like a co-op as he says, but you take then the, the, the uh, a limit, take the limit as the patronage goes to zero. So you have all these different types of co-ops where you have different definitions of patronage and Hanson says correctly, you can, you can think of any uh, corporate form as starting like, a, like form a co-op with different definitions of patronage, but then he incorrectly identifies the conventional corporation with patronage being supplying capital. Whereas what you should do is you take the, the idea of the co-op based on patronage and then you take patronage to zero. So you eliminate any patronage requirement. So what does that mean? That means that the membership shares in the corporation become just free floating. Anybody can buy them like you buy anything else. There is no patronage requirement. Whereas for a normal personal right, like you're voting in your country or in your city requires you to have a certain functional role to reside in the city, to be a citizen in the country. And when you die, your personal rights die with you. Your, your vote in the city or your vote in a country does not pass to your heirs, to your estate, but your shares in a corporation do. And that means that they, they become property and, and they became property by, by taking this patronage aspect and just wiping it out, taking the limit as it goes to zero. So there's no requirement to own shares in a, in a uh, standard corporation. So that's what, it's not a capital suppliers co-op, it's the limit of a co-op sort of universal corporation where there's no requirement for patronage. And that, then the membership rights are turned into property rights. And, and uh, as I say here, even if we didn't have it, it shouldn't be invented. Somebody would figure that out. So that's what the conventional corporation is. And that's why it's so dominant. One reason why it's so dominant in the legal system because there's no, you know, it can be bought and sold uh, like property. And, and uh, I, I, <clears throat> I mentioned in the book, uh, Trump's idea to buy uh, Greenland. And uh, Trump said, you know, people got upset about that. 
And, and uh, Trump said, well, look, it's just a real estate deal. And, and uh, people were upset because they're thinking of membership in a country is, is a personal right that attaches to living in the country, being a citizen of, of the country. But Trump said, that's ah, just a real estate deal. And people can stay or leave after, after you buy or sell the real estate. So all these liberal commentators that got upset about Trump buying uh, Greenland uh, routinely uh, see no problem in buying and selling corporations which employ thousands and millions of people that if they don't like it, they can go somewhere else. And it's just an asset deal. There's no, you're not buying and selling the governance of, of a group of people. So that's the sort of typical contradiction in, in the standard liberal <clears throat> mentality. So then the question is, okay, so the fundamental myth is false. The, uh, what is then the key institution? What is it that really characterizes the system? And first of all, following the uh, Citizens United case, there's been a lot of superficial talk on the left about the corporate form itself is the problem. And uh, you get calls, uh, various, I, I quote some of them in the book, calling to abolish the corporate form, which what they mean is they're abolishing the limited li so-called limited liability of shareholders for debts of the corporation. And of course, that's a mischaracterization characterization because the shareholders have zero liability for the debts of the corporation, just as they have zero ownership in the sense of their own ownership of the assets of the corporation. They simply own a share, a membership right in the corporation. So what would happen if you abolished limited liability in a corporation? Well, that means that only very rich people would be able to undertake any sort of enterprise of any size, of any significant risk. And that's exactly what would be to the delight of uh, Charles Koch or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or whatever other billionaire you want to say is, is they're the only ones that can really undertake a business enterprise because they can handle the personal liability. So the corporate form, limited li so-called limited liability, is really something that's very people-oriented. That means that ordinary people can undertake a business enterprise and not have the debts pass through to their personal assets, their homes, their cars, or, or bank accounts. So it, it's far from something that should be attacked by the left. It should be something that is actually supported. And in and, and, uh, and course, cooperatives, uh, other types of corporations all have that same uh, limited liability. So to make a long story short, the char characteristic feature is really the renting of people, the employment relationship. And uh, this is so embedded in our consciousness that just, just using the word rent is, is uh, and then now I'm of course talking about English, I don't know how it comes out in Swedish or other languages, but uh, uh, you know, I used to ask my students if, if they, you know, I, I describe uh, slavery and I describe feudalism. And then I say, does anybody know of a system where workers are rented and, and literally students don't know. <laughs> I mean, one of them said, well, you know, when, when uh, the slaves were needed in, in the cotton fields or the tobacco plants, they were rented out to be stevedores on the docks of Charleston or something like that. So they attached the word rent to uh, what happened when slaves were rented out as, as of course they were. And people just don't even know that that's the system they've lived in all their life. Change one word, just one word. And, and they, they're, 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 you know, they're flummox. They don't know what in the world I'm talking about. So that gives you the level of, of standard ideology that people change one word, people don't know. So the, uh, and the words hire and rent, we usually say we hire people and we rent cars in America. But if you go to the UK, uh, it's, it's uh, a, a, a rental car, it's called a hire car. And, and uh, so they use the word hire and the word hire in English law uh, stands for things as well as people. They don't make the distinction and, and uh, use the word hire as a universal term. So what it means is of course that you're not buying the person, you're buying the services of the person. You're not buying a man, you're buying a man hour and so forth. <clears throat> so 
that is the key institution. So the whole, uh, the left has basically been uh, led down the garden path by the Marxian analysis in attacking private property, whereas in fact, the employment system, the human rental system violates the very basis of private property, people getting the fruits of their labor. So they're more than delighted to agree with the Marxian analysis and it's really based on private property. They're not violating private, they're based on it. In fact, the system is based on violating the only principle that's ever been suggested for legitimate initiation of ownership is getting the fruits of your labor. So uh, this point about understanding the fundamental myth, it's not a trivial side point. It, it's, it has to do with the very nature of the system, why the left has, has basically gotten nowhere in a century and a half. If you read John Stuart Mill, you know, it's still, what he wrote in 1850, it still sounds radical today. And, and uh, so, uh, and that's because of this mischaracterization of the system and which skewed the whole debate uh, is about ownership, private ownership rather than being about renting a human being. So the whole book, name of the book, uh, is going back to the abolitionist uh, narrative that it's wrong to own other people, saying yes, it's, and it's also wrong to rent other people, uh, including voluntarily. So that's a recasting of the whole debate about the system and, and uh, zeroing in on what is exactly the, the uh, relevant institution, this renting the people. So the, so if that should be abolished just the way the uh, slavery contract, most slavery was of course based on involuntary, but there were also, uh, even in the United States, uh, voluntary, uh, people voluntarily entering into slave contracts and, and, uh, the, as well as the, um, the, the indentured servitude contract, which was for seven years, typically. So if the employment relationship is, is, is abolished, as, as is the point of the label neo-abolitionism, then the solution would be the members of the corporation or the people that work in it. So that's what we all know as a democratic corporation or whatever, think of as a worker cooperative or a democratic ESOP or, or whatever. So why focusing on this to the, on the ESOP conference, the ESOP is a way of financing and transferring ownership of a corporation to the employees. And of course, not running out the capital. So the corporation stays the firm, that stays the productive enterprise. And, and uh, so in that sense, you could say it, it, it approximates turning rented workers into worker members. So sort of a circuitous way to do it. And it's a particular way of arranging the financing and so forth. Uh, governance is typically through a, a trust. So it's not particularly democratic. These are things that we are changing in the ESOP form that we're proposing for Europe. But uh, that's the essential idea. But now if we, if we go to the narrative in the ESOP community, it's still 99, 44, 100 percent the ownership of capital. That, that uh, you know, ESOP conferences of the ESOP associations, I think you'll find very little, uh, uh, Chris is a better judge of this than me, you'll find very little discussion of democracy at the workplace. And I think also probably very little owner, uh, discussion of ownership of the fruits of your labor. It's always, it's the ownership of the corporation and, and uh, so it's exactly the view that I expressed 50 years ago uh, that all those rights are attached to the ownership of the corporation. Now the workers own it, isn't that great? So it's, it's, a, it's a good outcome, but, but a completely uh, different analysis of what are the actual rights and, and uh, <clears throat> not based on democracy, not based on getting the fruits of your labor. <clears throat> 